And now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines present Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Miss Judy Garland as star of Drive-In, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now, a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Judy Garland in a remarkable tale of... Suspense. I wish I hadn't let Ruth talk me into serving that last car that came into the drive-in that rainy night. It was late and I was tired. I'd been on my feet all day carrying heavy trays, hopping to it with impatient people glaring their headlights on and off in my eyes. Heaven knows there are a lot of impatient people in Hollywood. We car hops don't have an easy time of it. Talk about your mail carriers. Well, we're the same, raining or blowing or boiling hot. We've got to get through with that tray and know the reason why. Tired, hungry people who sit back in their car expecting a million dollars worth of service for a ten-cent tip. Why do we do it? Sure, there are other ways of making a living in Hollywood, but not many that hold that glittering promise that maybe someday, somehow, maybe someone will say... Why, that girl looks like Lana Turner. Yes, at least her hair's done up that way. I think I could use her, Rennie. The musical version of the Forsyth Saga. Oh, she'd be great in color. I think I'll ask her to come out of the studio. Yes, I know. Maybe it doesn't happen often, but there's always the chance. And, and there's always that hope. That's what keeps us going, I guess. But there are other things that can happen in the drive-in that aren't on the menu. Like that rainy night I was telling you about when I let Ruth talk me into serving that last car that came in. Millie, Millie, listen, please take his order, will you? I got three cars. Oh, look at the clock, will you? It's nearly midnight. I'm off party. Oh, please, Miller, just this once more. My gate's waiting. I'll do the same oh, for you, Ruth. Ruth. Now, what's oh. the matter with him? Can he read? Please do not honk your horn. It looks clear enough to me. It's a doctor's car. You see, he's probably in a rush. Anyway, you got nobody waiting for you. Oh, all right. Oh, gee, thanks, Mel. It was true, I... I had no one waiting for me, only the bus that was going to take me to Glendale where I lived alone in an apartment. So I buttoned up my raincoat and took a menu over to the car. Good evening. Never mind the menu. There's some black coffee, a pot of it, and a ham sandwich. Please hurry it. When I took his order over to the car, the window was rolled up a little too far and it interfered with the tray, so I reached in to wind it down. When I touched the handle, it felt wet and kind of sticky, too, but I didn't think anything about it. I got the tray firmly set and then I looked at my hand. It was as red as blood. I looked up quickly at him. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Dr. Morgan. I just had an emergency in the car. Oh, an accident? Yes, Sunset and Vine. Quite a crash. I just happened by and I took one of them to the hospital. Oh, gee, that's a shame. Yes, it's too bad. I walked back trying to wipe the blood from my hand with a paper napkin. It, it gave me a creepy feeling to have somebody's blood on my hand. Then I went in to wash. I was trying to keep close track of the time and... I was a little worried for fear the big drive-in clock wasn't right. It sometimes ran slow. So I took a coin from my apron pocket. I figured it was worth a nickel not to miss that last bus to Glendale. I walked over to the payphone and I was about to drop the nickel in when... I looked out and he was leaning on the horn and beckoning to me at the same time. And I put the nickel back in my pocket and hurried out to him. I'm sorry, but I'm in a hurry. I haven't time for this coffee to cool off. I'll take the sandwich with me. How much do I owe you? Well, uh... I'll be 42 cents. Oh, here you are. Thank you. I hope I didn't interrupt your phone call. It wasn't important, was it? <laughs> no, I was just checking on the time. I don't want to miss my bus. There was a clock right over your head. Well, that's usually wrong. If I have the time, it's about four minutes to twelve. 
Oh, I'm going to miss my bus. What time does it leave? At midnight from Hollywood and La Brea. Hop in. I'll take you. I'm going right past there. Oh, would you? I'll take the train. I'll be right back. I might still be able to make it. Okay. Uh, in my hurry to unhook the tray from the window, I gave it a jerk and it fell crashing to the ground. Oh, dear. Ruth? Yeah? Look, look. Help me with these things, will you? I'm going to miss my well, bus. Go ahead. Go ahead, Nora. I'll get it. I'll get it. We, we picked the things up quickly, and Ruth went off with the tray. I started to run around the other side of the car when I noticed something shining on the ground. It was one of the shakers that had fallen from the tray. I picked it up and started toward the driveway. Uh, why don't you just put that in your pocket? You can return it tomorrow. Come on, you're going to miss your bus. I put the shaker in my apron pocket, and I rushed over to the other side of the car. He opened the door for me, and I was just about to get in when I hesitated. I, I wasn't used to doing this kind of thing. The other girls sometimes let their customers drive them home, but I never did. Still, he looks so decent, and I... Come on. You'll miss it. Then he reached out as if to help me in, and I thought that he was really concerned about my missing the bus, because he seemed to pull me into the car. And first thing I knew, I was sitting beside him. Then the door slammed, and we were driving off. I was a little uneasy, but when I thought it's, oh, it's only a few blocks, I won't be in the car long. I suppose you're in a hurry because someone's waiting for you. No, I, I live alone, but I'd hate to walk back to Glendale in this rain. You won't have to walk. Well, this is very nice of you. I appreciate it. Not at all. Uh, would you mind rolling up that window on your side? There's a draft. Oh, of course. Uh, you can, uh, let me off at that corner over there. All right. Mm -hmm. Anywhere along here will be all right. This is fine. Right over there by the stop sign. Wait a minute, you're going through the stop signal. Am I? Yes, but... I'll, I'll get off over there by the other one. My bus! You're turning the wrong way. Am I? Yes, this this goes up to Laurel Canyon. Does it? Hey, let me out of here. You thought you were pretty smart, didn't you? Well, I don't know what you mean. Please, let me out of this car. You went right to the phone. You thought I wouldn't see you. The phone? But I was calling about the time. Honest, I was. The time? With that clock over your head. But that clock's wrong sometimes. Besides, who, who would I call? Why should I call anyone about you? You were calling the police. No, honest, I wasn't. Let me out of this car. You were going to catch a bus. You were going straight to the police. That's where you were going. Yeah, but why? Why should I go to the police? You know why. No, really, I don't. Because you saw it. You saw his blood. No, you don't. <laughs> there. You won't need to try to open that door again. Now we'll be getting along. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Judy Garland in Drive-In. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Judy Garland as Mildred with Raymond E. Lewis as the man in Drive-In. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. After I made that last try to get out, he broke the handle of the door. All the strength seemed to go out of my body. I just sat there as we drove on. We passed a few people and some cars in the next blocks. And I thought of calling out, but... Then I knew why he'd asked me to roll up the window when I'd first gotten into the car. Then we were at the mouth of the canyon. 
and I could see the road, dark and lonely up ahead. The car twisted and swerved. My arm ached from his strong fingers that had dug into it when I tried to jump out. I looked at him from the corner of my eye. He hadn't seemed like a criminal back at the driving, and he didn't seem like one now. His jaw was black from needing a shave, so his face... Well, it wasn't like a criminal's at all. It, it was so tired. Quit staring at me. Oh, look, I, I didn't know anything about you. Honest, I didn't. Please let me go. You know something about me now. Well, I won't tell anybody. Whatever it is, I promise I won't. A woman's promises. Remind me to tell you a story about a woman and promise. Oh, let me out. Please let me out right here. It's a long way back to Glendale. Well, that's all the better. It'll take me hours to get back, and you'll be miles away by then. I'm not taking any chances with you, Jim. Oh, please let me out. I've got to get back. You said no one was waiting for you. You live alone, don't you? No one will miss you. We both heard the siren then. He looked quickly in the rear vision mirror. Then he took a gun from his pocket and he turned to me. If that's for us, and we'll stop, remember just this. I've used this gun before tonight and I can use it again if I have to. <gasps> if I'm taking your go first. Now listen, I'm a doctor and you're a nurse. We're headed for an emergency. If you want to you won't try to pull anything. You're on awful fast for a wet night, aren't you? Followed you up from Hollywood. Uh, I'm Dr. Morgan, officer. This is Nurse Johnson, emergency call. I see your identification. He fumbled through his pockets with one hand, holding the gun in my ribs with the other. The motorcycle cop looked over at me. I thought for a moment I could signal him with my eyes. But then I knew he wasn't looking at my face. He was looking down at my white starched blouse, which you could see under my raincoat. He thought it was a nurse's uniform. Ah, here you are. Okay, Doc. Sorry I stopped you. Hey, just a minute. <laughs> What's the matter? Just wanted to tell you, rain started to slide up there a ways. Take it easy. Thanks, I will. You're not Dr. Morgan, are you? What do you say? Then we came on the landslide. It wasn't a big one, but it, it made a terrible mess of the road. He didn't slow down, and the car swerved crazily and it slipped from one side of the highway to the other. Suddenly, I felt as though the whole rear end had slipped down. I looked over at him. He was tense. His neck was turned white as he clutched the wheel. He shoved the car into reverse. Oh, I hoped it had never moved. It didn't. We were stuck, hopelessly stuck. Of all the luck. Suddenly the car was filled with light. A car had come around the curve behind us. This might be my chance. Remember, I still have this gun. Don't try anything. Say, we're stuck here. Could you give us a push? We'll have some California hospitality with you. I'll have to get out. I'll have to put something under the wheel. You stay here. There. there were some bushes by the side of the road. If I could reach them, I could perhaps run up the side of the hill and hide. And then in the morning, make my way back down the canyon. I carefully turned the handle of the door. I could see him in the mirror. He was at the back of the car. I eased the door gently open. Put one foot out. I was just sliding out when I heard it. You're not going any place. Come here, give me that raincoat. Why? I need something dry to stuff under this wheel. But I... You won't be needing it. Come on. 
He practically ripped it off my back. Wound it into a ball and bending down, he stuck it under the wheel. The gun stuck out of his back pocket. If I could get it, if I could lay my hands on it. I held my breath. I reached out. It seemed so far, but I finally touched it. Then I snatched it from his pocket swiftly. Look! Give me that gun. I'm going. You can't stop me now. Can't I? No. You, you stay right where you are. I won't hurt you. All I want to do is get home. I'm going, but if you follow me, I'll... You'll what? I'll kill you. I don't think you will. Yes, I will. You think I'm afraid. Aren't you? No. I don't care what happens to you. You're a murderer. You killed somebody. I thought you didn't know anything about me. I didn't, but I do now, and I'm going to tell the police. And stay where you are. No, don't. I'm not afraid. I'll shoot. Oh, too bad I used up all of those tonight. You could have filled me full of holes. Now give me that gun and get in the car. Are you going to kill me? What do you think? We were nearing the top of the canyon now. The road was very steep. The rain had let up. It was just drizzling now. Even though he hadn't answered my question, I knew the answer. He was going to kill me. I wouldn't get back home tonight. Not tonight or any other night. It was funny. I sometimes used to hate that little apartment of mine where nothing ever happened. But tonight... And then, for some strange reason, I thought about Ruth. What would she say tomorrow when I didn't show up at work? And I... I wondered where they'd find my body. Well, here we are. Lookout Mountain. Top of the world. Suddenly we came over the crest of the hill, and way down below the city stretched out for miles. Millions of lights glittering in the rain. For a moment I forgot everything. It was the most beautiful sight I'd ever seen. Ever been up here before? No. Nice, isn't it? Yes. I used to come up here with a girl once. We used to sit and talk for hours. Come on. We'll get a better view if we get out. I knew it was foolish to argue with him, so I followed him. But as he walked over towards the edge, I became frightened. It was such a steep drop. Well... Come on. I'm, I'm afraid to get so close to the edge. You won't fall. Look. That's Los Angeles over there. That bright line of lights is Western Avenue. I went to school somewhere along in there. I used to get in all sorts of trouble at school. But I got by, I managed. Everyone said I'd grow out of it. Over that way towards the ocean, that's Westwood. That's where she lived. This girl I was telling you about. That was the best part of my life, I guess. That's when they said marriage and a wife would straighten me out. Marriage and a wife would straighten me out in Westwood, they said. <laughs> Does your wife still live there? No. She's dead. Oh, I'm sorry. You needn't be. I killed her. Why? Because she couldn't keep her promises. Did, did you kill her tonight? No. A long time ago. The jury said I was insane. But I think it was the sanest thing I ever did. They put me in an asylum. Do you know what it's like being locked up year after year when you know there's nothing wrong with you? No. No, I don't. 
It isn't good. You'd do anything to get out. Anything. Anything. I knew. I knew if I could keep him talking, maybe a car would come along. Maybe something would happen. It was my only chance. What are you thinking about? You. You killed someone else tonight, didn't you? Yes. Dr. Morgan? Yes. He was one of the men who thought I was insane. Why did you do it? I wanted his car to get away in. I didn't want to be locked up anymore. Oh, but th they'll catch you. No. They won't find the doctor for several days. I saw to that. How can you be so sure? I do things thoroughly. What are you going to do now? First, I'm going to... And then I guess I'll go south. I knew what he meant by that pause. I started to back away slowly. I'd made a mistake by reminding him in the present. My hands went instinctively to my apron pocket for something to defend myself with. I knew there was a pencil there. It was sharp. Maybe I could scratch him or hurt him some way with it. But when I reached for it, I felt something else instead. Something cold and hard. I was puzzled for a moment, and then I remembered. It was a shaker I'd picked up at the drive-in. Stand still. Yeah, and then he started moving toward me. Me with only a pencil and a shaker to defend myself with. It's too bad I came into that drive-in tonight. Oh, why did you? Because I was hungry. Because I hadn't eaten for a long time. Weren't you, were, weren't you afraid someone would see you? No alarm had gone. Huh? How, how'd you know? I knew. If only you hadn't rolled that window down. Well, if you're sorry, why don't you let me go? It's too late. To... What's that? With a sudden movement, his arms were around me in a tight embrace. I started to scream, but suddenly his lips closed over mine. Pushing my head back roughly, he kissed me. I could scarcely breathe, and I, I felt the car's headlights on us like a spotlight. Uh, just look at this view, will you? <laughs> I'll have to do this in a picture sometime. Can't you see you're interrupting something? Come on, drive on, will you? Okay, okay. And in all this rain, you'd think people would have some more sense. He held me a moment longer. And when the car had gone, he released me. My pencil had fallen to the ground, and I was left with only the shaker in my hand. I fingered it nervously, and then I felt the top coming off. I felt the content spilling in my hand. What have you got in your hand? Nothing. Give it to me. No. Give it to me. He grabbed my wrist and pulled me toward him. We were moving to the edge of the cliff, but my other hand was free, and I threw the contents of the shaker into his face. <laughs> His hands flew to his face in an effort to clear his eyes, but I knew it was too late. The pepper had blinded him. He lunged out for me, but I stepped aside quickly and he slipped in the mud. His hands went out to steady himself. He clawed frantically at Finley. Then I saw him falling over backwards, over the edge. <laughs> Then my strength gave way and I felt myself sinking down to the ground. I don't know how long I must have been there, but when I came to it was raining again. I was soaked to the skin and there was mud caked in my hair. There was no one in sight. The lights of Los, Sith, Los Angeles stretched out in a pattern peacefully below. And I knew that somewhere at the foot of those hills was Glendale. And my apartment. I rose slowly to my feet and I started back toward the road. Somehow... Everything that had happened seemed unreal. Like a dream. Everything but the way he kissed me. To keep me from crying out.
Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Selected for your pleasure from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. And now it's curtain call time for tonight's suspense star, Judy Garland. Judy, you were grand. We hope you enjoyed your part tonight as much as we did your performance. Oh, thank you, Ken. As a matter of fact, playing the part of a waitress tonight was a treat. I just pictured myself knee-deep in juicy steaks. <laughs> <laughs> well, that reminds me, Judy, as a waitress, you deserve a tip. And here's the best tip I know. To make Thanksgiving dinner really outstanding, serve Grand Estate California Burgundy or Sauterne. For Grand Estate wines presented by Roma, America's greatest vintner, are the ultimate in wine excellence. Yes, the brilliant clarity, full fragrance, and mellow taste of Grand Estate wines please the most discriminating guests. Well, I know that my guests would agree with you. And, Judy, there's a reason Grand Estate Burgundy and Sauterne are distinctively better. Because for Grand Estate wines, Roma selects only the choicest grapes. Then the priceless skill of Roma master vintners... Necessary time and America's finest winemaking resources guide this choice grape treasure to rich taste luxury. So remember, when you serve grand estate wines, you serve the finest, the crowning achievement of vintner skill. Well, that's a real tip, Ken. And so you can follow it, Judy. Here with Roma's compliments is your gift basket of grand estate wine. Well, thank you. And while I'm giving out thanks, let me give a, give a great big portion with. Love and kisses to my great and good friend Bill Spear for his magical direction and to Raymond Lewis for playing the man so wonderfully. Well, thanks to you, Judy, and to Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of The Yearling, for their cooperation in making you available to us tonight. Next week, we'll have Chester Morris as star of Suspense. Oh, he's one of my favorite actors. I won't miss it. Good night. Tonight's Suspense play was written by Mel Dinelli and Muriel Roy Bolton. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Chester Morris as star of Suspense. Presented by the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. Ladies and gentlemen, in the coming weeks, Suspense will present such stars as Cary Grant, Olivia de Havilland, Alfred Hitchcock, Joseph Cotton, Roddy McDowell, and many others. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Suspense is broadcast from coast to coast and to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>